Hello, I'm Martin from Ashby's and today it is my absolute pleasure to show you the 800 PSI Enforcer. But before we get into how to use this amazing piece of equipment, I want to talk to you a little bit about the theory of carpet cleaning itself, because it's important to understand how to, um, how to correctly clean carpets and upholstery and how the machine sort of fits in. Um, I'm being ably assisted, by the way, by Alana. Say hello, Alana. Hello. Hiya. And um, yeah, so I'm going to show you um, some of the items that fit in with how to clean carpets and then you'll see where the machine fits in and then we'll go around the machine and show you how to correctly use that as well because this video is aimed at people who are not collecting machines with a one-to-one -one instruction that I'd normally do. Uh, they're receiving them on a pallet. Some people have never used carpet cleaning machine before so it allows them to uh, basically get the machine off the pallet and know a little bit about how to use it. Uh, before they actually start using it, which is always good. Right, um, the theory of carpet cleaning really is uh, a six stage process. So sta stage one is to dry vacuum. We wanna remove all the dry soilage that's on carpet. We wanna remove all the pet hair, all the people's hair, uh, all the dry dirt and things like that. Um, so we're gonna use either a, a decent vacuum cleaner, uh, which you may already have, or if you don't, we do something here called a dry vacuum attachment. Dry vacuum attachment, uh, which fits to any carpet cleaning machine, uh, hot water extraction carpet cleaning machine, which is one where you're uh, spraying down water and sucking it back up again. This connects to the vacuum hose. This connects to your water hose. And basically, you always have your vacuum sucking the, uh, the dry dirt up. Here you've got your water hose and a valve which allows you to vary the amount of water that comes out of a jet inside this vacuum stop. The jet creates a waterfall effect across this pipe so that your dry dirt and pet hair and everything else mixes with that water and becomes dirty water and returns into your recovery tank as dirty water. And it doesn't use a lot because you can control the amount. For example, this is an 800 PSI machine. Some people may only have a 135 PSI machine. So this allows you to vary the amount of water that's coming out of that jet. And you just wanna look here to check you've got a good flow of water um, <clears throat> to make sure that you're dry vacuuming correctly but you always need that flow of water. You can't dry vacuum with any hot water extraction machine without the water filter working because otherwise you'll be sucking the dried dirt and pet hair and stuff like that directly into your recovery tank and, and essentially into your vacuum motors and whatever isn't being caught in your vacuum motors is being blown out back into the room where your machine is. So you always need that water to act as a filter. Um, another great thing about this um, hard floor wand is that you've got, if you look there, Alana, um, a dry vacuum turbo head, which is uh, powered by the air, basically. It's an air turbo head. In other words, it's not electrically powered. But my goodness, you don't need to have electric power if you're using something like a Sensei Ninja or Enforcer because you've got colossal vacuum strength, which far exceeds what you get out of most, if not any and all, vacuum cleaners. So uh, you get a result which is really, really good. And also the customer has never really seen anyone dry vacuuming with something like this, for example, where they have seen someone dry vacuuming with uh, your standard commercial vacuum cleaner, whatever that might be. So it's a great way to just have one tool that you switch between your carpet cleaning wand and your other bits and pieces and you add this as a tool which allows you to pre-dry vacuum the carpet. So step one is to dry vacuum the carpet to remove pet hair, people's hair and dry dirt so that all you're left with is the stuck on soilage around the fibres of the carpet. So step two is to pre-spray and we want to pre-spray with just a standard pump up sprayer that we sell. This is called an XI6 sprayer comes with a choice of three jets, your jets being these items here. That's fitted with the blue one, which is for pre-spray. Um, they are chemical resistant. Don't put hot water in them. Any plastic sprayer will not tolerate hot water. You'll deform it, especially as you start putting the pressure into the bottle. It softens the plastic and obviously deforms. So that's a great 
sort of budget priced option. Uh, for those of you starting uh, with a, um, a startup chemical package, this is included with it from Ashby, so that's great. Put that there. Um, another great thing for those of you starting up and wanting to pre-spray correctly is a Hydroforce Revolution. This is a Hydroforce Revolution inline sprayer. Your uh, chemical will go in the bottle here. Uh, it can be neat and undiluted. Um, and basically you have a spray lance here, which allows you to spray onto the carpet, but you attach it to your carpet cleaning machine's water hose. And it takes the water, goes this way, obviously it travels this way. You've got a Venturi valve here, which draws the solution in and mixes it with the water from your carpet cleaning machine at the dilution rate, and yeah, come around here, Alana, at the dilution rate, which is, can you see that okay? <clears throat> which is indicated on here. So anything from as strong as a one to four, all the way down to as weak as a one to 64, which is there. And that is, that's much too weak for our applications normally. We, we tend to vary things between maybe a one to eight, uh, and, and all the way around to maybe a 1 to 20, but it depends on your actual chemical. Um, but yeah, you can be cleaning a very dirty restaurant carpet where you've got lots and lots of grease. So you can have temperature in your water, which is important because heat cleans. So heat helps to break down your soilage. So you can put a hot pre-spray down and you can put it down at the dilution that you'd want, which is quite high. You're gonna be wanting like a one to 10. It depends on your product. But then if I, uh, my next job, for example, is um, someone's uh, domestic situation where they've always taken their shoes off and they just want the carpets refreshed. They're very house proud. Sometimes you can, if you're out cleaning carpets, you'll know this, you can get, get to a job and there's literally no dirt on the carpet. They just want to refresh. So there, when you're pre-spraying, you can turn it right down to maybe a one to 20. So you're not having to over wet on the jobs, which a lot are a lot more dirty, you can actually just dial up the chemical strength. And the important thing is you're putting down your pre-spray hot. So you're not over wetting, you're putting it down hot and that's the best way to apply it. These aren't cheap, uh, but they do go on for many, many years um, and I would recommend them. They're a great little tool. Lots of people have got them. So they're out there and being used and have been being used for years. But that Hydroforce Revolution is a great way to pre-spray your carpets quickly and effectively where you just, you've got your machine in and you're just switching from one tool uh, to another. And it's great for use with the 800 PSI Enforcer because you have a remote control where you can switch the pump off, which allows you to depressurize and just quickly change your tools over before switching it on again. So we'll come to that later when we talk about the machine. So, so far we're dry vacuuming, stage one. We're pre-spraying, stage two. Step three is to agitate in that pre-spray to make it as effective as it can be. Um, we can do that with one of two things. We can be manual about it. If you follow me over here, Alana, <clears throat> not many people do this or use this. They all do it or should do it, but they don't really use it. This is um, uh, a carpet pile brush. It's 18 inches wide. And uh, yeah, these bristles don't deform <clears throat> when they get wet and when they get warm. So they good for scrubbing carpets. But I mainly use these brushes, like most people, for grooming the pile of the carpet all the same way at the end of the job. That's really what they're used for. But if you had two of them, you could use one as uh, a pre, you know, an agitation pre-spray uh, device, you know, like a brush for grooming your, agitating in your pre-spray. But like I say, most people are gonna use that for laying the pile all the same way, getting rid of those tool marks at the end of the job. Um, a great contra-rotating brush machine, which is very, very well priced, and we sell lots of these, is a SIBO Duo. A SIBO Duo. Uh, this is a SIBO Duo, and it has two contra-rotating cylindrical brushes. One, two, and they turn in on each other, and they're quite dense as well. So when it's on the carpet, <coughs> you actually cannot really push it forward. There's a lot of resistance, but you switch it on, and the and it floats, essentially it floats over the carpet quite nicely. I can do that actually and show you guys very, very quickly. Just quickly put it in. Turn it on, but yeah, here. Actually, let me show you, Alana, if you spin around, just follow me around here, here we go. 
<laughs> follow me over here. Here we have a carpet. Um, and look, if I'm trying to push it forward, I'm struggling. It's got a lot of resistance, but as soon as I turn it on, it just floats over the carpet. And you might want to come in, Alana, and have a little look at how it just rejuvenates the pile. But massages in that pre-spray and makes it ultra effective. So that's the best way to agitate your pre-spray. And again, it shows your customers that you're doing everything that you should be doing and really, really uh, impresses them and makes the right impression with the customer. And I love using this in my own home before I clean my carpets as well. It's, not, it's kind of satisfying to see all the pile that's around where people walk through doorways or they come in through the front door, or one of the sliding doors at the back. Uh, where it's flattened a little bit or around by the sofa and start bringing it up, bringing it, uh, it up. And actually, Alana, we could use that in your house, couldn't we? Just around your, where your patio is. Please. Yep. One day I will, but not yet. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the SIBO duo. So, so far we have dry vacuumed, we've pre-sprayed, we've agitated um, that and massaged in that pre-spray. So now we're left with a load of lo loosened soilage, which is stuck onto the fibers. And we want to rinse that away. And that's where this beast comes in, the Enforcer, uh, 800 PSI. Uh, this is a machine I'm gonna show you today. I don't know if you wanna have a little look around that, Alana, just do a bit of a spin round. Um, by this point, you've probably already got one, but yeah, it's an incredible piece of equipment. And we're gonna do that with something I'll show you in a moment. This here is a two jet stainless steel wand, a twin jet wand. 12 inches wide from there to there. That's your vacuum slot. That's always sucking up and recovering your water that you spray down via these two jets here. They cross over just a little bit, just enough so you get a nice spray pattern across the width of the wand. Um, moving round to here, you have a valve, double mount Kingston valve, that's called. Um, when I squeeze my double mount Kingston valve, that's when I release my water. Now there is a technique to using a wand. And uh, the technique for using our wands, really to get the best from them, is to remember that they all have a good working angle. Um, they have a tolerance to that angle, but the best working angle for our two jet wands is when this is level to the floor. So when this area here, this, this handle part is level, parallel with the floor. So we don't want to be down here. We don't want to be right up here. We want to have it level. And I like to work in one meter lengths. So I would start here and work backwards. That's important. We're not working forwards and I'm squeezing the trigger. I'm doing about two of these carpet tiles. That's about a meter or so. Then I release the trigger and I pull back just an inch or two to pick up the water that I've left from the jets. I don't immediately push forward because I'm left with a, a wet line of water here. So I pull back an inch or so, pick up that last bit of water and then just simply do two dry passes over the area I've done. And when I do these dry passes, I tend, because I'm left-handed, I tend to move to the left very slightly to pick up any overspray and I tend to work to the right. But just remember, if you're gonna go that way, when you push forward, just come very slightly, a centimetre or so to the left. Do you like the way I'm mixing metric and inches together? This is imperial and metric. I should standardise really, but anyway. So let's say you move half an inch to the left, <clears throat> and then I tend to work to the right, but we always want to finish. So just to, I always go back with a little bit of a scrubbing action. I'm not particularly scrubbing, I'm just resting my hand on there. I'll show you this later. Release the trigger, pick up that last bit, two dry passes, one, two, and then I move across. Those dry passes are very, very important because those multiple dry passes will ensure that you recover as much moisture from the carpet you're cleaning as possible. You know, sometimes we see all sorts of bad wand techniques. If anyone here is a member of any kind of face bay organization, my goodness, some of the videos that I see on there are absolutely uh, I can't really think of the word to use. They're not correct is one word. But these guys are out there trying to make a living. So when they're ready, come and see us and we can get you the right equipment essentially. But yeah, 
good one technique really, really uh, is, is paramount and, and is one of the most important things when you're carpet cleaning. It's one of the most simple things to do, but one of the most simple things, in my opinion, to get wrong. So that's the theory of how you want to do that. Obviously, as you're working, you'll have your own style, but always want to finish with those two drying passes and you always want to pick up that bit of moisture before pushing forward because problems really can only happen essentially if water penetrates the backing of the carpet. So by picking up that last bit, we're preventing that happening. And by doing those two drying passes, we're further present, preventing that happening. So we're essentially, we're certainly with a machine like this, it's rare now that you'd ever get any kind of calls about I've, from carpet cleaners. I would receive a call saying I've shrunk a carpet or colors have run or whatever. Um, because the equipment is so good that you really have to try to to, uh, to have an incident like that happen. So if you are a new starter, bear in mind what I've said here because that will really set you up right for uh, minimal aggravation when you're out there in someone's house cleaning carpets. So we've got dry vacuum, pre-spray, agitate, rinse extract, and then we want to um, apply our finishing sprays. Now, Actually, I'll show you, it's probably a good idea to show you what you can put in the machine, thinking about it. So this is a premium extraction liquid, which uh, dilutes at one to 340. So it's very, very concentrated. Essentially, I would put maybe a cap full of this to a full tank, okay, in the machine. This is an enforcer. So one cap of this, essentially, to a full tank. Uh, if you feel you need to go a bit stronger, you can, but you probably shouldn't because what you want to do in the machine itself is keep what is in the solution tank, your fresh water tank, as close to fresh water as possible so that we're using it to rinse and extract away that stuck on soilage. We're not putting down more of a residue. If you imagine you're having a shower, uh, you do not shower under soapy water is fresh water rinsing the soap suds off. If you're washing your car, you are then rinsing it off with fresh water, ideally pure water, so there's no impurities. But what we're doing with this machine, what is in that solution tank, really should be the fresh water rinse. So we wanna keep it as chemical free as possible. So only use a small amount of a high quality liquid detergent, this one's great. Uh, because it has a high degree of water softeners in it. It doesn't powder out when it dries. It doesn't dry to a powdered residue. Um, and it's been designed for metal headed pumps, which all the four, six and 800 PSI pumps are. So that's premium extraction liquid. That's for carpet cleaning. Uh, okay, I could give you pH values, but it's, it's all on the, the label and I'll put the links uh, at the bottom of videos and things like that. So. Yeah, it's for carpets and it's safe on most of them, if not all of them, that can be wet cleaned. And this one is a more neutral pH one, which has a dilution rate of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, one to 100. Um, it's for sofas, upholstery and wet cleanable rugs. Okay, or if you had a very delicate carpet, you could use this as well. But really, I believe that you could use that on most things. So you'd be fine with it. We're just going to be, we've got such a small amount of it and we're going to be extracting what we've put down anyway. So, yeah, this one I would put maybe three capfuls into a full enforcer tank because it has a different dilution rate to the other one. When you're filling your enforcer as well, it's important to note you should always fill it with a nice clean bucket. We've got two uh, buckets that we uh, provide in our starter packs, they're colour coded. We've got a, a white one and a rather dirty looking red one because the white one is the one that we keep purely and simply for filling the machine. And we can do that now, actually. Let's put a bucket in the machine. I've already put some water in. This is your solution tank, but we want to always fill with a nice clean bucket, one, one which has never been used to empty into because if, you, if I were to empty into this bucket, and tip it away, rinse it out once, twice, three times, I've rinsed it out. I think I've got all the fine grit out. I actually haven't, and that really does degrade your metal-headed pumps. So anyone with a four, six, or 800 PSI pump, you need, uh, for want of a better word, virgin clean buckets. They need to be very clean. So here we have a nice new bucket, which we fill with, and never use a powdered detergent, always a high quality, quality liquid. 
This is our solution tank and you can see you've got a recessed air for your lip of your bucket so that just fits in like so and it's almost got a funnel design you'd have to work very hard to spill it so your water just goes in there like so. We'll come back to that later. Our dirty water bucket is here, our red one and that's one we'd never use for filling. So yeah, um, once we've rinsed and extracted away all our detergent with our wand, the last thing we do is apply our finishing sprays, things that fix the colour and brighten. And one of the ones that we would use is Supreme Finish. That basically is an acidic spray that you spray on in a light mist. Here's one we made earlier. That we spray on in a light mist, Supreme Finish, and that fixes the colour, it brightens, and it chemically neutralises. So it makes the pH return back to roughly around seven. So that the, the uh, colours are brighter, the colours are fixed. It's also got a bactericide in that one as well, so that's very nice. Um, so that's your finishing spray. And also, you may want, and it's a bit of an old label, I apologise there, Extra Fresh, which is a bactericide uh, deodorizer. So it's got a lovely fresh linen fragrance on the latest one. Not sure how old this one is actually because it's in, here, in our training room. But um, yeah, the latest one's got a nice fresh linen fragrance to it. So it's very pleasant for the customer. But also it has a very uh, strong bactericide in as well. So it prevents those musty odors that you can get where it smells a little bit like a damp dog on a wet carpet. So yeah, that's the one to lightly mist over. And the last thing we want to do is we want to groom the pile of the carpet all the same way. So we do this, Alana, with an 18 inch carpet pile brush, which we saw earlier. And um, yeah, we just go over to our pile, uh, sorry, to our pile, to, to the far corner of the room. And we groom the pile all the same way, but we work from the far corner towards the door, just getting rid of all the tool marks. Although, to be honest, some of my customers' geometric patterns are incredible. So, yeah, we always train people to remove all the tool marks, and I, I recommend you do that. But, um, yeah, I have seen some very impressive geometric patterns, and people seem to like them. So maybe double-check with your customer. But that is the last thing that you do. You groom and remove all your tool marks so you don't lay the pile. Uh, those tool marks don't, don't remain. In my opinion, that's the right way to do it. So, But let's go back to the machine. Absolute monster of a machine. It's an 800 PSI enforcer. Um, it's fitted with two 6.6 inch, two stage Lam Amtec vacuum motors mounted in parallel. Now these are protected from backspin and this is very important with a couple of valves in them. So when I turn one on, uh, the other one doesn't start in reverse so that when I'm turning the second motor on, it's not spinning uh, in the opposite direction from the way it would like to be spinning. So yeah, we have two valves that prevent backspin. That's quite important. Not many machines have that. If any others, I'm not sure, but we have those in. And that helps to make the vacuum motors last longer. Um, it's a three power lead configuration, this machine. You've got one power lead for the one pump and one vacuum. The second power lead is for another vacuum and then a third detachable power lead for the heater. And the first thing we wanna do with this machine is plug it in. So uh, let's do that. Okay, so if we come round to the back here of the machine, push it forward. This is our white power lead. We just unravel it. <clears throat> should always fully unwind these. Um, well, you should always fully unwind any power lead, drawing any amount of power really, because otherwise they can warm up. Actually, there we go. Let's just go and plug this in. I'm gonna plug this in to one of the remote control sockets that you get with the machine. Okay, that goes in there like so. When you buy an 800 PSI enforcer, you get these sockets, um, which are basically infrared remote control sockets. So reasonably cheap and inexpensive to replace. And you get three of them. So I'm gonna turn that on. This model works this way. When you get your machine, you might have a slightly different model, but basically I've now assigned it to channel A. So you, you notice that the light was flashing and when I uh, press that uh, A, it assigned it to channel A. So I can now turn it on and off by using the A button. Uh, we're going to make B for the black lead. So let's just unravel that. Look at the detail. Twin exhausts. Very, very nice. That's because you've got those two vacuum motors in parallel. 
So you've got high airflow optimization there, which is always nice. Uh, the black power lead, actually you might want to come over and just have a look at this, Solana. Like I say, when you get yours, it may slightly differ depending on the ones we're using at the time, but these are the ones we've got. Turn them on. That's flashing. Press that, B, and now I can turn it on and off using the B button. But to be honest, I can turn them all on and all off with that button. But it depends if you wanted to switch them individually. We can do that. So that one turns them both on and both off. That's the one I'll be using today. Okay, so if we notice we've plugged both power leads into individual sockets in the wall. That's because each one of these leads needs to go independently to one of these uh, electrical sockets. I cannot run them off uh, one extension lead. I would need to use an extension lead for each lead so that each uh, lead was going into a wall socket. Okay, that's a very important thing. So they all, all require uh, a wall socket. I'm gonna get my uh, heater lead now, which is here, this detachable power lead, 25 foot. One end, this end, actually called the socket end because it's not got positive prongs on it, the negative female uh, socket, goes into Alana, if you can just follow me, there. That's plugging in your heater, okay? And then the lead we now plug into the wall. We don't need to put this on uh, a remote control socket because the heaters are thermostatically controlled and have low level safety cutoffs. So they automatically switch on when the water level drops. And we can have a look at that as well. I've turned it on there. Okay, so if you follow me up here, this is the um, tank heater switch. And I'll switch that on in a moment. Actually, I'll switch it on now. Here we go. That's a heating in progress light. And that's your thermostat control. Anything between naught and 60 degrees is, uh, is catered for. So we'll turn it around. Might as well turn it around to 60 to get it warming up. And it actually stops there. You can't go beyond it. So don't try and force it. It's got a restrictor pin in. Um, yeah, you don't want to overheat your pump head. So if, always make sure that you don't go beyond 60. If for some weird reason it goes beyond 60. 60 is the highest uh, temperature that you would want a metal headed pump to be, uh, to be handling water-wise. The pump being the solution pump that handles the water. And if we have a look inside this uh, solution tank here, this is where your fresh water goes. You saw it earlier. We need to have water above the level of a low level safety cutoff. I don't know if you can see that, Alana. Can you see where my finger is? Oh, where is it? There, there it is. Okay. That white polypropylene float, there we go, we can see it better now. And that's our low level safety cutoff. Water must be above the level of that low level safety cutoff for the heater to actually come on. And as the water level drops, it automatically switches off your heater. Um, we can actually see our heating element in there as well. Don't know if you want to come back in, sorry about this. That's your heating element. It's three kilowatts, so it's the most power you can draw from the plug socket. So it's as efficient, it's heating water as fast and efficiently as electrically possible. Let's wheel that back. This is such a lovely machine, it really is. Um, <clears throat> right, the next thing we want to do is connect up our hoses. So let's do that. Now we've got two sets of hoses we're, we're gonna use today. Um, this one, is a two inch hose set, they call it. It's because the vacuum hose is two inches in diameter. And here you can see you have a two inch hose cuff, which fits onto the two inch vacuum intake spigot here. Now I always check the integrity of my cuffs by making sure that they're screwed on. So if you can see that you can, you can actually unscrew them. I don't want people to unscrew them. I just always want you to check that they're they're done up. You don't want to over tighten, just, just enough to make sure that they're not coming off. And when you push them on, you don't want to screw them on, you just simply want to push. Now, we have, I've only just turned this heater on, so this water's cold. This, this 
cuff is quite supple, but if I was getting this out of my van or it was not supple, if I were to push it on, you can sometimes split a cuff, a plastic cuff. So what you want to do is put them in to your hot water tank, hot, uh, your hot water in your solution tank for about 10 seconds, just to soften them before you push them on to make sure that you don't actually split them. Okay, so we just push that on like so, and that sits on there. Now, this is called a male connector, for those of you who don't know. Um, the hoses are 3000 PSI, wire reinforced with a machine swage, so very high quality. And they go into the female connector on the machine, and to activate uh, the female connector, you just pull the sleeve back there, and then push it in until it clicks forward. Now you want to make sure that you, from time to time, grease that female connector so that that sleeve will push forward uh, without too much hindrance. But yeah, that just clicks straight on. This hose is 25 foot, which is 7.6 meters. So we're gonna lay it over here a little bit. You can see here that this particular hose, and this is the way I like to cuff most people's hoses, has a one and a half inch, uh, one and a half inch um, cuff on the end, two inch thread, one and a half inch slip. But what it means is that you can then attach that to your tool if you needed to. However, these are quite, two inch hoses are less flexible than one and a half inch. So when you're inside someone's house, I personally prefer to use one and a half. So I would tend to use this as my primary hose, but my extension hose, if you, if you see what I mean. If I was using only one hose, I'd have a one and a half inch hose set that I'll show you in a moment because it's more flexible. Right, I'm gonna put onto here a joining tube. A joining tube joins uh, two vacuum hoses together. And the joining tube that we require for this particular uh, configuration is one and a half inch to two inch. Um, you've got a two inch, a two inch uh, slip there and a one and a half inch slip there. Okay, now again, you should warm this cuff before you slide it on. So I'll do that. Although this water is oh, rather cold at the moment, but warming up quite nicely by the looks of it, bubbling away. And you'd leave that in for 10 seconds. Let's pretend we've done that. And you then push it in to there. And to be honest, I'd probably leave this joining tube in this hose because I'm unlikely to ever attach it to one of my tools. It's too, I, I think they're too inflexible compared to the one and a half. So I just use them as an extension hose. So I tend to leave this in there. Just a little bit of a hack there for you. Lay this out. There we go. Right. Now this is a one and a half inch hose. Far more flexible. Um, we've cuffed this, as you can see, one and a half inch in diameter, so the flexibility is better. Uh, it's cuffed with a two inch uh, hose cuff at the machine end, which is the male end, and the other end, the tool end, has a one and a half inch cuff, which is suitable for connection to your tools. But it's much more flexible in, in, when you're in someone's home, so you have a far uh, less of a chance of damaging their door frames. This is called a corner guard, by the way. Uh, it's a, a robust uh, sort of flexible plastic item which protects people's uh, door frames from damage uh, with your hose. And I'm just gonna walk over here because we have all this sort of thing going on here at Ashby's. When other people, not me, drag hoses past things. So look at that damage. <gasps> I'm never hiring that carpet cleaner again. Hold on, put that there. Shows the customer you care. They're happy, you're not damaging all their, it's that stuff called architrave. And you're also not damaging uh, newel posts and things like that as you go up around people's um, staircases. So that's good as well. We also have hose hooks. But yeah, that just shows customers you care. If you were to buy, I think they're about 10 pounds. And if you were to buy four of those, they would last you for years and years and years. You can use them on every job and show every customer that you actually are respecting their property. So that's a good thing to have. I'd have you back in my house. Right, okay, so let's join these hoses up. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the hose cuff, I'm gonna warm it in the water in the solution tank. 
So uh, let's put that in there. Again, leave it in for a few seconds, 10 seconds officially, just to soften. There we go, pretend that was 10 seconds. Nice and flexible now, because the water's starting to warm up. And I'm gonna connect it to my primary hose, like so. Also check that it's screwed on, it is, lovely. Just push it on, and that can seat well on there. <clears throat> I'm gonna connect the male and female connector together. That's the male, that's the female. Pull back the outer sleeve. Don't know if you wanna show that, Alana, just so that people who are picking up machines know. There we go, and that just pushes forward, and that's the bit you can grease every now and again, just to make sure that it, you know, connects nicely. All right, bit of WD-40, that sort of thing. Right. We've got our hoses in place. I'm just gonna lay them out. Normally you'd obviously have these going upstairs or into another room, but we are gonna use them all in this room. So it's a, a little bit underfoot. You'll have to bear with me. Okay, so that'll do. And this connects to your twin jet wand, which I'll show you now. There we go. Cuff, that really doesn't need to be warmed because that's a parallel. So it just pushes on rather nicely. And there's your male connector. There's your female connector. Again, just pull back the outer sleeve and it just pushes on like so. If I was struggling, because in reality, you may have back pressure here and I'm trying to put it onto my wand, I could depress the trigger so that as I push it on, it kind of releases any back pressure, albeit onto the customer's carpet, but you're, you can clean it up pretty quick and it will connect on nice and easily. Okay, another little hack is when you're putting down your wand, the fastest way to break a hose is to put it down like this. Drop it down like this, you're definitely gonna end up making, a, you know, making it fail a lot quicker than it would do. And these will last for years and years if you do this. So the way to put this down is to put it down that way round on its handle so that you're not stressing that joint there there is a protector on the hoses after the female connector for that reason, but do not put them down like that. You always want to put them down just like that so that you're maintaining the integrity, not putting pressure on that point there. So that's a good thing to do. Okay, let's show you the machine. So I think I've already said, I know I've already said, <clears throat> that all your water goes in here and you uh, have seen me pour it in. So that's great. Let's move round to the switch panel if we can, Alana. No laughing. Okay, here's your switch panel. That's your mains on switch. It's a green switch. So as long as you've got your uh, power leads for the machine plugged in, it will come on. And when we turn this on, it starts about three cooling fans, one on the side, two underneath, which basically blow cold air over the electronic components within the machine, keeping them nice and cool and dry, which is exactly the way you want them to be. Now that is your awesome 800 PSI pump switch. Uh, remember with great power comes great responsibility. So yeah, 800 PSI, that's your pump uh, switch there. That's vacuum motor number one and vacuum motor number two, and you can switch those on in any order. You have the, um, valves in place that prevent backspin um, so that the, the secondary motor you haven't switched on isn't spinning backwards when you switch the uh, when you actually switch it on so that's nice it keeps them as I said keeps them lasting longer um, and we've already covered this this is your thermostat control that's your heating in progress light and you can see now the light's gone out the machine has achieved the temperature 60 degrees which is set on the dial um, yeah, so that's your switch panel. I think what we do now, we will switch the machine on and I will show you something actually called a silencer. Where is it? Over here. Now this is a silencer. <clears throat> you may have seen these before, but this one's for a twin exhaust machine. So you've got uh, two pipes to deal with instead of just the one. And what it does is a very simple yet highly effective item which, and I'm just warming the cuffs in the warm water there, which allows you to basically baffle 
your vacuum noise as it comes out of the machine. So it's great if you're working in someone's house or if you're working in an office environment or you're working in a nursing home or a hotel, anywhere where you want to keep the noise level to a minimum. It's even good for you because you haven't got a machine making more of a noise than it need to. Um, even if you're outside with a machine, having a silencer on is, is you know, a good idea, unless you want to draw up a crowd really. So if we just turn the vacuum motors on, just show you what the noise level is normally, then we'll connect these two and we'll see how it's reduced. So I turn on VAT1, turn on VAT2, connect up host 1, connect up host 2. And then that just hangs on the rear handle, so it's a very simple device that um, allows you to dramatically reduce the noise level. I'm now going to show you how you can reduce your pump pressure. There's two ways. You have a pressure regulator valve, which is this guy here. It's called a pressure regulator valve and a flow rate control, flow rate control. The pressure regulator valve drops the pressure but maintains the flow rate so it doesn't drop. The flow rate control turns down both the pressure and the flow rate at the same time. Now this is an 800 PSI machine and in reality uh, most carpets you know you would not want to clean much above 400 PSI so I'm going to turn down the pressure to 400 PSI for carpet cleaning. That's your pressure gauge. Let me just go and turn the pump on and then I'll drop it down using this pressure regulator because when I'm using my wand I want to have full flow but I basically want to have dropped the pressure. So clockwise on both these the pressure regulator and the flow rate control is full flow, full pressure if you like. As I go anti-clockwise, I reduce. So that's fully wound in clockwise, so that's giving me full pressure and flow. And the pressure regulator is also fully wound clockwise. So I'll drop the pressure and we'll reduce it from around 800 PSI down to 400 PSI, which is there. I'll just go and switch the pump on. There we go. As you can see, we're up at 400 PSI. Sorry, 800 PSI, I beg your pardon. And now we'll drop it down using this pressure regulator, turning it anti-clockwise until the pressure gauge shows 400 PSI. There we go, it's quite a lot of turns involved on a pressure regulator. 400 PSI. Now I'm going to turn on both my vacuums and do some carpet cleaning. I'll show you some wand techniques. So we turn on vac one, turn on vacuum motor number two. Squeeze the trigger and the water comes out release the trigger and always pick up that last bit. Do two dry passes. So I'll slow that down for you. Squeeze the trigger and the water comes out. Reduce, sorry, release the trigger and pick up that last bit. Sorry, I slowed down too much there. And do a couple of dry passes. Again, one more time. Squeeze the trigger and the water comes out. Do about a meter release the trigger and then do a couple of dry passes just picking up everything that you put down and again keeping this wand level to the floor we don't want to be up here we don't want to be down here we want to be really making the machine come under load so we're picking up everything that we're putting down so we're getting the fastest possible drying times okay that's a wand now let's try a hand tool I'm going to, basically, if we come around here, when I use a hand tool, I don't need to use more than 150 PSI maximum. So I'm going to drop my pressure right down. Using my flow rate control. Another thing I could do is switch the machine on and off. Actually, let's show you that. Switch the machine on and off with your remote control.
This is your remote control, can have it in your pocket. So we can drop the pressure by just simply turning the machine off and disconnecting our wand. I'm actually gonna depressurize quickly, just on the floor there, which I'll suck up in a minute with my hand tool. Now the and this is one of my favorite hand tools. It's the Rotovac Shear Dry Upholstery Tool. It's the clear headed version, so you can see all the dirt coming out, which is nice. Um, it's got a head that free swivels, which means basically it spins round, which is really handy if you're working on upholstery because you're not having to fight it round. Um, very, very comfortable to use, rounded edges. And it, hasn't, it doesn't grab at the material because if you look at the vacuum slot, which is, which is uh, quite revolutionary really, it, it hasn't got a wide uh, gap to grab at material. So even though you've got fantastic vacuum, on your enforcer, you're not gonna be grabbing at the material because it's, it's sort of supported. And if you look, you've got those little holes all the way along there. You see those? A well manicured nail look. And you've also got those to the rear as well. Uh, so you actually get water out the front and back, which means you clean on the front and back stroke of the hand tool. So you work fast, gently cleaning the material. So it's just really, really comfortable. It's got this hider ho hose design with about 10 foot of um, hose on it, which means that all your um, connections are kept away from the material when you're cleaning, so they're not bashing and crashing into it um, and, and, and potentially damaging it. First thing I'm gonna do is go and connect it up. So we move around here, Alana. And another nice feature with this tool is that you have a flow rate control. And if we look at that there, you can see uh, anti-clockwise is open which is where we want it to be we want this tool to be at full flow really because I'm going to alter everything with my flow rate control on the machine and uh, you can also shut it down as well to uh, reduce the flow if you haven't got a flow rate control on your machine but we have both a pressure regulator and a flow rate control so it's these things are a bit superfluous to our requirements that goes over like so because it's got this clever little bag which basically stops all your connectors from scratching a hard floor should you be working on a hard floor. Uh, <clears throat> put that round like so, let me just get down here, it's a bit easier. Put your bag like that, connectors in there, just pull it a bit tight and that just stops them scratching the floor. I think that's quite a nice little uh, feature as well. And then we're gonna connect up our vacuum hose here like so, so we're all ready to work. I'm gonna go back to the machine now and I'm gonna switch it on using my remote control. So I want channel A and that's gonna turn on vacuum motor number two and our pressure pump. And then I'm gonna drop the pressure. I'm gonna drop the pressure down. Oh, it's already there. Was that 400? If I wanna drop it down, I just open the flow rate control, which is this one here turn it anti-clockwise until I get about 130 psi. That mark there is 100. So I'm at about 130 or so, 150, 130. And that's absolutely perfect for uh, cleaning upholstery. I'm now gonna turn on my second vacuum motor. Now when you're upholstery cleaning, you want to use the same sort of theory that you'd use when you're using it on a carpet cleaning wand, you wanna do you always finish with those couple of dry passes. So we squeeze the trigger, water comes out. I'm not sure if you're seeing that, Alani, you're seeing that well? Okay, and always do those couple of dry passes to pick everything up that you put down. Now, when you're working on edges, you need to bar off to create vacuum. So there, I'm not getting any vacuum, any suction on this material, so I need to bar it off. Squeeze the trigger. There we go. I want to show you as well, if I can just show you, you don't get any overspray. Look at this, very little overspray. Which really, and drips coming down. You don't get, it, get that. With other hand tools, you get a lot of overspray and you very often get drips going onto your protective covering that you put on the floor when you're doing upholstery cleaning. Another thing I want to show you is how dry this hand tool is. If I just clean this, I know we're not, we're not doing it right, I'm going to go over with a couple of dry passes. Here we go. And then we 
towel off as we would do when we're at upholstery cleaning and we'll do a separate video on upholstery cleaning. The material was almost ready for use. Sit on there, check that out. Any wet marks? Hopefully none. If there are wet marks, it's not due to this. But um, yeah, great tool, very, very easy to use. I'm gonna switch the machine off using my remote control. I want to talk to you now about where your dirty water ends up. So this is your recovery tank. This is your dirty water tank. All my dirty water has ended up in there. And if we have a look, we've got a float cage there. There's a ball in, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. There's a ball in there and that ball, uh, basically when the water level rises, the float ball will, uh, the change in air pressure is enough to make that float ball get sucked up as your vacuum motors are sucking through this cage and mechanically block off your vacuum. So they go high pitched and it's time to empty the machine into your designated dirty water bucket. However, with this machine, you do have <clears throat> auto empty, a gravity auto drain, which is a really, really uh, simple, nice device. You put the end of this hose wherever you would like the water to drain, which would be into a toilet or uh, the correct uh, sewer line. A sewer line, the easiest one to get hold of really is the kitchen sink output. Uh, is a good one as well. So wherever you want it to go, basically wherever you tip your water, once you'd finished carpet cleaning is where you want to ditch this. So sorry, you take off your dump valve spout and you put on this, okay. You have a little clip here, which you just tighten just to make sure that it stays on. It's just like a, a thumb drive or a worm drive with the, with the uh, yeah. And then you just tighten that up there and you would open, I'm not going to do it because I do not want it emptying all into the uh, training room here, but you would leave that in the up position. And when your vacuum motors are on, you're getting full vacuum. As soon as you switch them off with your remote control or whatever, um, they will dump, uh, it will dump the water out of this one and a half inch hose. There's no filters to worry about. You're not gonna block anything with the one and a half inch hose. So yeah, really, really good. Another way of filling the machine <clears throat> on this particular model, uh, it has auto fill. Uh, built into it. Now I want to show you this and I want you to have a, a little look around it because we put this in the lid. It wasn't an afterthought. This was put here for autofill and, and many machines that offer autofill, they don't have this kind of design. Now let me explain. This is recessed and protected. As you can see, it doesn't, it doesn't poke out. You've got holes drilled in the lid so that any leaks from these type of connectors drip into here, go back down and into your solution tank. So it's not running down the side of the machine onto the customer's uh, floor. It just connects on like that. You obviously put this to a hose, uh, sorry, a hose, to a tap. So we supply you with this female connector um, and you basically find some hut garden hose and then your different tap connectors, but you just need a pressurized water source and it'll just keep it continually topped up. Uh, which is good because it doesn't empty all the way out. So once your heater's up to temperature, it just trickle feeds. And so your water constantly stays hot. And I've done jobs where I've been working for like three hours straight with this auto drain and auto fill. And um, yeah, it's quite satisfying and knackering. But yeah, it is quite good because you're not stopping all the time. You can really crack into the job. And uh, your bucket boy will be a little bit upset if you have one because he hasn't got much to do. So um, yeah. Auto, auto drain, auto fill, very, very simple to use. Now, at the end of the job, we need to pack the machine away. So, we take everything off. Let's undo that. Here we go. And we're going to basically use our red pump out hose to pump the water out. We're gonna pump it out of our clean tank into our dirty tank. This is how we empty at the end of the job. So we disconnect our pressure hose, get rid of that. And this is a pump out hose. It has, sorry Alana, maybe come up here for a minute. It has a male connector on one end and an open uh, end at the other. Put the open end into the dirty water tank, close the lid, just so the weight of the lid is on it. Put the male connector into the female connector on the front of the machine. And I'm gonna um, turn on just the pump. So I'll turn off my vacuums and I'll turn on number A. 
and basically we're just pumping out. I'll switch off my heater as well. Although there is the low level safety cutoff, I'll switch it off. Don't need it on anymore. And I'm gonna move round to here. This pressure gauge is not gonna represent the pressure we're getting because I've just put an open line in. I'm just gonna close everything down so it's pumping out as fast as possible. But as I say, this will not raise because we've just put an open-ended uh, output into the female connector. So you're never gonna generate any pressure on your pressure gauge with that happening. Turn that round, quite a lot of turns. Do you know what? I probably wouldn't move this in reality, so forget I said that, because I'd probably want to leave it at about 400 PSI if I was doing carpet cleaning next anyway, so I probably wouldn't move that. But this would now, you know, this machine would now be pressurized at 800 when I next turned it on. I've, I've shut the flow rate control cl uh, clockwise as well. And we can see that the water is pumping very nicely out here and we don't have the vacuum motors running. We don't want the vacs running because I want to be able to rinse this cage, rinse this tank and give it a nice clean out so it's fresh for when I get to my next job. And if I had the vacuum motors running, I'd be sucking water directly into them. And we do not want to do that. It's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to protect our vacuum motors. So I'll put that back, close the lid, have a little look in here, we're still going. We've got a mushroom filter in there, it's called. We can't really see it, but it's just in there. And we'll just keep pumping until the water um, that's coming out is um, basically, sorry, what's coming out of your uh, pump out hose is mainly air and not water. And we've exposed that mushroom filter. So I'm gonna leave it doing that. We'll come around here. We'll remove the silencer if we have one. And We'll start emptying into our red bucket, our designated dirty water bucket that we've never used to, to fill. I'll put that on there like so. That's our angled adapter to angle the water. When I open this up, remember if I was using auto drain, there wouldn't be anything in here, but we haven't. So some water in there. That's lovely. Okay, so look, we're getting almost everything yeah all the water's out now so at this point we'll switch the pump off which is this switch around here there we go and drain the last bit of water out we'll disconnect this pump out hose take it off pop it over here with the other paraphernalia and drain this last bit of water into there okay have a look in this recovery tank because i wanted to show you that oh, if you can look Everything's drained out, which is unusual for a machine. Um, normally you have to uh, tilt them forward, but everything drains out because we have a, a design where it's all coming forward towards the dump valve, and that's quite a nice feature. You're normally having to put your foot there and hoist the machine forward, so that's completely drained out. Now the next thing we want to do is run both vacuum motors for three minutes with the recovery tank lid open. So I'm gonna turn these on, then we'll cut the video and we'll come back. Okay, now we've run both vacuum motors for three minutes. We've got lots of fresh, cold, dry air in through the recovery tank, through the high level safety shutoff here, that cage, through your vacuum motors and out of the exhaust. Um, yeah, that gives you uh, a nice dry vacuum motors that are ready now to pack away. And it really, really extends the life using that pump out hose, running the vacuum motors for three minutes. That's essential stuff really. Um, we'll close this lid down. The next thing we need to do is unplug it unplug it, uh, wind the leads up and, and put it away. So I'll show you how to do that. Um, yeah, so what we'll do, we'll spin it round. So we've got slightly better light. First thing we do, we turn the green switch off. And uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is turn the power leads off at the wall and gently unplug them so that we maintain the integrity of the plugs. There we go. This is your heater lead, no longer needed. So we'll unplug that. It's always important with a lead to make sure it's unplugged from the wall if you're gonna do what I'm doing here, which is wrapping it around my arm. You're perfectly fine to do that as long as it's unplugged from the wall. Otherwise, if it was plugged in, every time I do a turn, I'm putting a twist in the lead and it'll end up looking like the old school telephone uh, cables, but they're all curly. So that helps to keep that looking nice. We'll pop that over there. And um, right, we've got our two um, cables here to, to uh, wind up, store and dock. 
So these are our cable winds here and here. They also are roller bars to, to uh, help you load and unload from a vehicle. These are the plug docking points here and here. The plug actually docks into the machine so it maintains its integrity. So when you're loading it and unloading it, you're not gonna crush it, which is a nice feature. So the, the bottom cable goes to the bottom cable wind and you wind them anti-clockwise, not too tight. So just nice and neat. Let's move this round here, there we go. Because you can always tighten them up a little bit um, at the end and you can also loosen them a little bit at the end as we'll see. Just wrapping them up, there we go. Now this one goes to there so uh, it fits quite nicely but look it's a little bit short so I just nip it up and there we go, in it goes. Just make sure it's docked nicely and neatly and there we go, safely stored. Now this lead goes to the top one as I said but I'm going to go underneath that roller bar so that I'm not I don't want that because I'm going to roll the machine into my vehicle. So I want it there. And again, let's go anti-clockwise round. Not too tight, not too loose. And we can always adjust later. Just nice and neat. I really love this 800 PSI Enforcer. It's so powerful. Complete overkill. I love it. And I don't know if I've been working here too long, but look at these twin exhausts. Fantastic. I mean, you've got the in-series, you get one exhaust, but with the parallels you get two. Okay, so look, it looks like we're a little bit short there, which is no big deal. You can see that, oh dear, we're a little bit short. All we need to do is just nip that round slightly and it docks very nicely. Just look, all your leads are safely wound up and stored, ready for loading. Okay, and the machine tilt and rolls into a vehicle. So you would, if this was the back of my van, I would open it up, whatever I need to do, flap something over the bumper, maybe one of these entrance mats, which we also sell, um, are very good, because I st always stand a machine on an entrance mat because it has an absorbent top here, a waterproof backing here. So when I'm emptying or filling, if I do spill anything, it doesn't go on the customer's carpet or hard floor, but I can also have that in my van, flap it over my bumper, and it protects really nicely. So I offer it up to the back of my bumper. You've got pivot point here. So the bumper kind of ha sits about here somewhere. And if you move around here, Alana, you can see that we've got um, grab handles where you need them. So if I just come around here, because I'm left-handed, I'd have one hand here, one hand here, and basically just pivot it. So I'm not lifting, I'm pivoting on that bumper, moving around to here to grab it, tilt it back, and I've actually got another grab handle. If I lay it on the floor, you'll see another grab handle just here, which I can grab. So I'm here and here, and I just roll it in. When I want to take it out, I pull it backwards, and I just allow it to, on that pivot point, pivot and come down to the floor like that. So they do tilt, tilt and roll in quite easily. They've been designed exactly to do that. It wasn't an afterthought. We knew they'd be on the heavier side. They're not supposed to be our lightweight machines. If you're looking for that, you're looking for a sensei really. But this is our, <clears throat> our yeah, our truck mount performance portable. Um, pretty much the 400s are as well though with the in-series Vax. I like those as well, but the 800 is, is a beautiful piece of kit with its uh, valves to prevent the back spin and stuff like that. It's all good. So to recap the important points with this machine, always fill with a very clean bucket, one that you've never used to empty. So you want to make sure there's no fine particles of grit anywhere in the bucket. Always use a good quality liquid detergent, something like premium extraction liquid or the liquid extraction cleaner because they are designed uh, for these metal headed uh, pumps. Uh, they have a very high degree of water softeners in them and they don't powder out. So it doesn't uh, cause wear on the metal pump with the stainless steel piston going backwards and forwards. So we're, we're looking for clean buckets, no powder use. Very small amount of, of detergent in the machine because everything really is going down in the pre-spray and what's in the machine is, is to rinse and extract that loosened soilage that we spoke about at the beginning of the video. 
Um, I should mention always use defoma. Defoma, I didn't show you this, is applied, best applied down the end of your vacuum hose. So it's sucked down and ends up in your dirty water tank and basically breaks down foam as it comes in if there's any residual foam in the carpet. Um, defoma, there's many defoamers. There's one over here actually, but uh, we sell a very nice Prochem liquid defoma. That's very good. This one's a, it says Stay Pro, but Bioproductions product. But uh, yeah, Prochem liquid defoma is, is my preferred choice really. So always use defoma. Don't let the machine freeze. <clears throat> Don't let any of your carpet cleaning machines freeze because when you let machines freeze uh, or tools and hoses freeze, your brass fittings may crack. Let's have a look at a wand and I'll show you where you'll have problems if we go this way, Alana, and I'll come back to the machine. I know it's not very good light that way. Okay, so when you allow your machine to freeze, these kind of brass fittings which are throughout the machine and also on your tools and hoses, you'll get a crack very often, upper connector there, like a small fracture that water will come out of. You can get a split going up the valve here or the nut can shear that way and you'll get water coming out. These things never happen in the summer. Every single manufacturer of uh, carpet cleaning equipment will tell you the same thing. Do not let them freeze, okay? So that's very, very important. Don't let the machine freeze. That means people always ask me, well, how do I do that? Remove it from the vehicle, just make sure it doesn't freeze. Warm the vehicle up, keep it in a garage, whichever, whatever you need to do, just don't let it freeze. You've got frost on your window and your, your vehicle, you've got problems, potential problems. Um, at the end of the job, always use your pump out hose to empty. That was that red hose, this red hose here. Okay, open end one end, mail connect to the other. Goes into the front of the machine, didn't it? And it goes into your recovery tank and we pumped the water from this clean tank into your dirty tank without the vacuum motors running because you gave that cage a rinse. We don't want to suck water into your vacuums. So we gave it a nice rinse, which means it's nice and sanitized, almost ready for the next uh, customer. We're not giving them uh, a warmed up dose of what, was, uh, what we were cleaning before. So if we, did, you know, if we didn't clean it out, we turned our vacs on, all the air that's coming out is going through your dirty tank and that's what the previous customer's dirt basically. So it, it allows you to keep that tank nice and clean. Always uh, use a separate bucket for emptying that red bucket if you have a color coded system because that'll make sure that you're not using your clean bucket to empty. And um, at the end of the job, this is vital, lift the lid up, run both vacuum motors for three minutes while you pack other stuff away. And that will make sure that your vacuum motors are packed away uh, nice and dry. And that really will, will sort of double the life of the vacuum motors, literally double them. So always do that. And that's it really. Yeah, just run your vacuum motors at the end of the job. Now, thank you for watching this long video um, and bearing with me. If you have any questions, you can get me on the telephone. Our number will be on this video. And you can also drop us an email if you need to via our website or contact us through Facebook or whatever you need to do. But yeah, quickest way if you need to speak to me about your new machine is to give me a ring. Thank you for watching.